Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for showing up. I know today is the last day of finals, but we really appreciate you guys coming and being in attendance for this wonderful talk. We have two really distinguished speakers joining us today from the UK. Um, we have Dr. Amber Huff, who's a social anthropologist and political ecologist. She is a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies in the UK, where she's a member of the Resource Politics Cluster and a member of the STEP Center at the University of Sussex. She received her PhD from the University of Georgia, where her training focused on environmental anthropology. Her primary areas of focus include politics of conservation, resource struggles and conflict, environmental policy, rural livelihoods and human adaptability, and the politics of indigeneity and autochthony within resource struggles in Southern Africa. Dr. Patrick Huff is a social anthropologist and associate lecturer in the Department of Geography, Environmental and De Development Studies at Birkbeck University of London. He received his PhD from the University of Georgia where he conducted ethnographic field work within the anarchist milieu of New Orleans. His research interests include social movement, radical political feminism, political economy, and political ecology. The title of their talk today is Many Futures Are Possible and Some Are Already in the Making, Indigeneity, Autonomy, and Reconceptualizing Development. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Amber Huff and Dr. Patrick Huff. Thank you. Thank yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, the title of our talk today is Many Futures Are Possible and Some Are Already in the Making. Um, and uh, hopefully we can have good discussions um, following our talk. Um, I'm going to actually start out and introduce our talk and, and then give one case study from my research in Madagascar. And uh, then I'll hand it over to Pat, and then um, we can open it for questions and any sorts of feedback or comments you might have. And yeah, thanks so much for coming today. I know um, it's uh, it's probably uh, yeah wearing on everybody the, the season. Um, so just to open it up, um, I want to give a few remarks on kind of reflecting on anthropology, anthropological legacies and contradictions, particularly in relation to um, studies of and working with um, people who identify as indigenous or are identified by others as indigenous, um, and really just give some commentary on the field and then I'll move on. Um, from unilinear evolutionism to salvage ethnology to man the hunter, and more recently, the decolonial turn in anthropology, the politics and practice of research with, about, and by members of indigenous groups around the world have been one of the hallmarks of anthropology since its earliest days. It's also been really a continuous source of ethical, theoretical, methodological, epistemological, and ontological debate and tension within the field and beyond. Many critical anthropologists have argued that this is in no small part and really in many ways due to the fact that anthropology um, as the study of humanity, but also as a field of applied research has historically been um, enmeshed in a historical matrix of colonial knowledge, politics, and power. It's just the past, uh, in just the past few hundred years, processes of colonization and globalization have worked to dominate, dehumanize, and facilitate the erasure of diverse peoples and life worlds or ways of being to make way for universalized and modernist notions of progress and uh, civilization. These dynamics have unfolded in different places in different ways, and this has affected how different traditions of anthropology have developed. Um, it's also affected relations between anthropologists and indigenous groups of people. Um, the early U.S. tradition of anthropology is associated with both progressive political and theoretical interventions, and this includes um, work debunking unilineal theories of cultural evolution that had been popularized in the 19th century. Um, at the same time, work discrediting eugenics and racial science and assumptions about the biological basis of racial categories um, was conducted, but this was also conducted using the remains of indigenous people collected and studied without their consent. At the same time, salvage ethnology stocked the exhibits of natural history museums and university archives across the US and Canada through practices that emerged as a direct response to North American settler expansion. 
Many early 20th century anthropologists contributed to collections of human skeletons, material culture, and exhaustive information on the cultural practices, languages, and folklores of Native American peoples out of concern that they would otherwise be lost to science, even as these very peoples themselves were experiencing genocide and forced assimilation. In contrast, the British social anthropology tradition evolved in the context of British imperialism and in situations that required the practical management of social differences to pacify and colonize external populations and maintain political control. For example, E.E. E. Evans Pritchard's famous ethnographic research among Nuer people happened in the context of his work as a colonial agent for the government of Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, a position that he accepted, although with hesitation and misgivings. Um, his research, which was groundbreaking for anthropology, was commissioned to aid in colonial governance of indigenous pastoralist populations that were resistant to settlement and rule. So out of the practical contexts of colonial contact, um, of administration, missionization, policing, settler expansion, warfare, and wealth extraction, um, emerged both the research methods that we valorize and the study of human diver uh, in the study of diversity and social change, as well as bureaucracies, forms of social control, um, and, and images and stereotypes of otherness that have been retained in post-colonial institutions, including the state. These continue to have powerful marginalizing effects on people around the world to this day, and have shaped a terrain of people's struggles for identity and autonomy. Of course, contemporary anthropologists tend to be highly aware of these legacies and their tangible effects, particularly on socially and political, politically marginalized peoples in the present. Um, this is heightened by the fact that we often live and work in places with long histories of colonization and other forms of external intervention. And this includes development interventions that are rooted in ideas of modernization um, and which many see as reproducing at times discredited linear notions of social change and progress as well as applying sedimented colonial and extractive logics in the name of governance um, to govern people, land, natural resources, or in the name of addressing global challenges like poverty, inequality, or growth. This set of legacies and contradictions makes it necessary to constantly reflect on issues and unresolvable tensions really around um, history, ethics, and positionality not only in the places that we work, but also in how we produce knowledge and disseminate knowledge about different groups of people. So in this talk, we're going to use two examples from our research, um, one on conservation in Madagascar and one based on work with the Kurdish freedom movement to explore some of the complexity of indigeneity as a way that people might self-identify, but also as a social or legal category that can be used by states or international institutions to categorize people and that's associated with variable collections of rights and protections, but also assumptions, stereotypes, and potentially exclusions. In recent decades, um, an increased level of international recognition of indigenous rights has been touted as a major triumph internationally for the international community over centuries of inequity. Um, and this is widely seen as a step toward a more inclusive transnational political field. Um, however, um, the case from Madagascar that I'm going to talk about today shows potential risks involved with the legal category of indigenous peoples in conservation and development contexts in the global south. Um, and this case demonstrates how images and metaphors of indigeneity can be used strategically to claim territory, um, to claim resources, and can actually undermine the capability of people who may or may not choose to self-identify as indigenous to assert rights and advance political and social goals in conservation and development contexts. Since the 1990s, exclusionary biodiversity and forest-based conservation has become one of the main focal areas of development policy and international aid in Madagascar. And this draws nationally on a powerful ecological degradation narrative with origins in the colonial period to justify enclosure of lands by government agencies, non-state partner organizations, and even specialist communities, um, including biodiversity scientists. The national crisis narrative explains deforestation and habitat loss as engendered by poverty, 
skewed economic rationalities and high birth rates among rural subsistence producers. Um, a key element of this national narrative is that Malayasi people who depend on forest resources are represented in terms invoking the imagery of invasive species. Um, imagery of this kind of essentialized and destructive rurality implies transgression against a greater good. Um, the value derived by local producers becomes subordinate to, for example, wealthy investors or NGOs, and even mining companies seeking to set up biodiversity offsetting schemes. Narratives are reified through boundary mapping, um, through biodiversity assessments, and through the strategic deployment of often questionable social data. These discourses serve to enable and support the reproduction of uneven social relations and economic distributions and social stratifications. And they marginalize forest resource users in particular um, ways. And they undermine people's ability to engage politically as well. Um, often people are unable to petition for their rights to territory um, as they've already been represented as irrational criminals, violating the integrity of nature and preventing the country as a whole from reaching economic development goals. It was in this national policy context that the Mikaya Forest in southwestern Madagascar became a site of plans for a new protected area in the mid 2000s. So official claims assert that the Mikaya Forest is the last remaining block of pristine and undisturbed spiny deciduous forest in southwestern Madagascar under extreme threat from migrants and what are called false Mikaya, which I'll get into a little bit more in a minute. Um, however, the regional landscape is neither undisturbed nor uniform. The region is comprised of diverse and anthropogenic landscape types. These include coastal dunes and mudflats, mangroves, forested dunes, dense and viney deciduous forest, rain-fed wetlands, and dry spiny scrubland. The forest itself, until 2012 at least, had a human population of over 10,000 people mostly diversified um, and subsistence oriented agro-pastoralists and forager farmers. The Mikaya forest is crisscrossed by ox cart paths and roads, villages, hamlets, wells, ancestral tombs, swidden fields, these are all scattered through the forest. City dwellers refer to this region along with most of rural Madagascar with the term Ambani Buitsi, which means below the hills or below the dunes. And this is a term without any real geographic specificity but that denotes you know, extreme rurality and isolation from city, uh, city centers and state infrastructure. Um, so the Mikaya is a forest, but Mikaya is also a social identity. And I've worked with Mikaya people since 2007. Um, in the Masikoro dialect of Southwestern Madagascar, the word means, uh, the word Karaza means type and Mikaya is a Karaza of people a type of people. Um, there are types of all sorts of things, animals, fruits, soils, trees, and social identities. So in this region, there are three primary Karaza of people. Um, there are Mikaya, Vezu, and Masikuru. Mikaya self-identify and are identified by their neighbors as the people who live in the forest. They're materially quite poor, um, but are acknowledged as experts at forest livelihoods. Vezu are people of the sea who practice marine foraging on the reefs that hug the west coast. And Masikura describe themselves as people of the savanna and woodland to the east of the forest, specializing in farming and raising cattle and other livestock. But despite norms that associate these paraza of identities with unique local ecologies and lifestyles, Mikea, Vezu, and Masikuru are historically the same people, and clans and families cross all three. Identity can shift regularly depending on season or situation, and Mikaya people frequently also identify as Masikuru or Vezu, really depending on what they happen to be doing and where they happen to be at a given time. Mikaya people are represented in policy documents related to the establishment of the highly exclusionary Mikaya Forest National Park as a small, culturally unique population of indigenous and primitive forest foragers living in the small lakes region at the heart of the forest. People that these documents refer to as true or indigenous Mikaya are permitted to live in controlled habitation zones within protected area boundaries and are exempt from the sorts of resource use and habitation restrictions 
that other people in the region um, are forced to abide by because according to policy documents, as pure hunter-gatherers, their traditional practices and exploitation of resources are in perfect harmony with their natural habitat and are considered compatible with the management objectives of the protected area. Mikaya are the only people in Madagascar to be formally recognized as indigenous by the government and by the World Bank, which is a major funder of the national park. Um, presence of the assumed true Mikaya people as described in these documents is stated in fact as a justification for the legal, for legal restrictions on all other people's resource use and habitation within protected area boundaries. By restricting habitation and subsistence activities of others, who are referred to variably as false Mikaya, peasants, migrants, and other bad words, planners state that park policies are actually protecting traditional Mikaya habitats, um, protecting Mikaya livelihoods, and protecting cultural practices from the invasive, destructive, and culturally polluting influence of outsiders. Protecting what policy documents call the valuable human capital of true Mikaya means fencing and defending the Mikaya forest from a rural majority depicted in terms of invasive species along these national degradation narrative lines. Now these images um, are supported by people like foreign documentary filmmakers and nature photographers and journalists and even missionaries who have visited the forest in search of documenting the primitive foragers that they've heard stories about. In media productions, Mikaya are dressed up in or dressed down in loincloths um, and given uh, uh, only traditional uh, material culture to use. Um, they're contrasted to other people living in the region, represented as you know, pure hunter-gatherers, culturally and linguistically unique from other Malagasy and in balance with the forest environment. Some say Mikaya aren't quite human. Um, some say Mikaya lived in the forest before the first ancestors of modern Malagasy people. And some say Mikaya can live in the dry forest because they drink no water and only get their water from eating honey. Mikaya are similarly described in documents related to the national park as a small, culturally unique and endangered population of primitive hunter-gatherers and pristine foragers. But what do Mikaya um, and their neighbors actually have to say? Well, according to Mikaya oral historians and documentary evidence, this is a relatively recent social identity that emerged concurrently with an island-wide trend of ethnogenesis that was associated with the founding of indigenous kingdoms in the 17th and 18th centuries. And the earliest Mikaya were in fact coastal pastoralists and refugees from inland areas who established residency in the forest to avoid warfare, slave raiding, and cattle raiding to cope with food shortages, to avoid persecution, the threat of arrest, and accusations of witchcraft and sorcery, also to resist taxation, and during the French colonial period to resist corvée labor recruitment. Most contemporary Mikaya consider the forest to be a space of relative refuge from state violence and exploitation and a source of forest-centered livelihoods, yet they're also full members of Malagasy culture and mainstream, maintain strong social ties with kin and kindred living outside of the forest. Local notions of social identity don't make the distinction between true and false Mikaya, nor do any actual people living in the region resemble the representations of primitivism and difference that have rendered idealized Mikaya as unique primitives in popular Malagasy culture or in development funding proposals. Distinctions among ecologically noble members of the indigenous Mikaya population um, and destructive false Mikaya or migrants or others are not meaningful locally and are thus impossible to operationalize in the enforcement of policy. In other words, Mikaya are recognized as indigenous peoples, but rights to habitation and resource use are for true Mikaya only, when in fact no true Mikaya exist in reality. So there are significant incongruities between official representation of identity and lifestyle that guide policy and local history, cultural norms, and socio-environmental realities on the other. So in order to remain in the forest, as Mikaya people wish to do, people must abandon mobility, livelihood diversification, clothing even, subsist only on foraging and so-called primitive gardening, and avoid markets, agriculture, wage labor, cell phones, and other amenities. Um, Really, I think it's important to note the descriptions of primitivism that work to construct this compelling policy and narrative 
and comprise really an acid test of cultural authenticity that are applied um, when evaluating whether or not somebody has the right to stay in their home are in fact locally salient indicators of extreme poverty. Um, so the presence of, while the presence of true Mikaia is stated um, as a justification for the legal exclusion of other claims to resources and habitation within the protected area, um, in fact, uh, by enforcing these definitions, you're ensuring that nobody um, can, can benefit because nobody actually resembles these definitions. Um, and now I'm actually going to pass the presentation on to Pat, um, who's gonna finish this out with the case and conclusions. Okay. Um... You were breaking up there a little bit, Amber. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Sorry. Okay. We're um, <laughs> we're in the same house, but separate rooms. <laughs> so, um, okay. Well, uh, again, just to kind of echo, uh, you know, what Amber said to begin with. Uh, thanks, thank to you all for being here and uh, listening to us on uh, Friday night at the end of term. Uh, you know, much appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, so with that, uh, I'll get started. <clears throat> okay, we have the map up. Great. Um, you know, first, I want to just say a little personal background. Uh, I've been involved with the uh, Curtis Solidarity Movement in the UK for about seven years now as an engaged scholar and uh, activist. Uh, my experience is, you know, firsthand working alongside Curtis activists, activists as well as you know, closing movement discourse about that, I think, in, in the Q&A. Um, okay, I'm getting a message that says your connection is unstable, so maybe I'll talk about it, and I don't know. But, but right now, I really wanted to uh, give a little general background, because despite the movement's rising international profile, I find it best, you know, not to assume that everyone kind of knows the, the, you know, ins and outs and wider specifics and so on. Hello. Is Pat cut out? Okay, let me let me just bring him to my computer. Sorry. I'll be right back. Hey Pat. <laughs> okay. Can't hear. Can anyone hear Pat or me? We can hear you, Amber. We can't hear Pat. Okay. Yeah, give me a moment. Okay. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Okay, I'm, I'm back. Yeah. I did it turn the uh, mic off? Okay. Okay, uh, testing, you can hear me, okay. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, Kurds are an indigenous people closely associated with the mountainous regions of Taurus, Zagros, above Mesopotamia, as shown on this map. Kurdistan uh, sets in a kind of socio-cultural 
geographic superposition uh, within and across four modern nation states, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. Uh, there's also a, a significant Kurdish diaspora in Western Europe and elsewhere in the world. Um, it's, is that okay? Can you hear me? I'm, I'm, looks like Amber might have- There's a slight lag. Uh-huh. Okay. Maybe, maybe um, if you turn your camera off, that might help. Okay, I'll try. I'll try with that then. Let's Thank see. you so much. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's why I turned my camera off. Okay. Okay. Camera off, microphone on, and yeah, I'll go back. Uh, so yeah, there is a, also a significant Kurdish diaspora uh, in Western Europe and elsewhere in the world. In, in recent years, the Kurdish freedom movement has captured the world's attention due in large part to the revolutionary struggle in North and East Syria, uh, Rojava, as Kurds have called it. Uh, the brave, tenacious, and ultimately successful uh, war against the forces of the so-called and self-proclaimed Islamic State, known variously as ISIL, ISIS, or more pejoratively, Daesh, um, captured the world's attention and admiration. This victory was uh, tremendous, but there is much more to the story of, Kurdish free of the Kurdish freedom movement um, than is often touched upon in popular uh, media accounts. After all, the revolutionary development in Rojava and the defeat of the Islamic State would not have been possible without roughly 40 years of sustained and intensive collective organization on the part of uh, Kurds. Uh, Amber, can you uh, change the slide? Amber, click, click that slide. Amber, are you there? Yes, I did. Slides changed. Okay. Um, so this is just a, an image the, from uh, 2017 uh, when local uh, the Cur local Kurdish community in Brighton, that's where we're based, um, had been staging a, a, a series of hunger strikes to raise awareness about the plight of Kurdish political prisoners um, in, uh, in Turkey. So I'll just leave that there. Um, and again, we can talk more about that uh, in Q&A if, if people are in, uh, in this presentation, I want to address this kind of deeper and more detailed history and present of the Kurdish uh, freedom movement. More specifically, I want to talk about the ways in which the freedom movement is enacting uh, a profound program of decoloniality and attempting to make possible a different and better future. With the formation of the four nations that I mentioned earlier, in the early, uh, early to mid 20th century, Due to the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and European colonial machinations, Kurds found themselves uh, ethnic minorities within the bounds of modernizing eth uh, ethnic states that were not their own. In this process, Kurds have faced marginalization, oppression, and violence, often enough genocidal violence. The, res the response of these four states to the presence of Kurds within their borders has varied in degrees um, of violence and oppression, but none of them have been particularly kind to the Kurdish populations. Uh, the rise of the Republic of Turkey in the early 20th century is emblematic of the abuses meted out to Kurds. The aim of uh, Turkey's modernizing project was to create a homogenous nation state. In its uh, modern constitution, was all inclusive of citizenship. To be a citizen, one was by legal definition to be Turkish, and to be Turkish, one was a citizen. This was a kind of nationalist power fantasy, however, since neither Turkey nor the wider region has ever been anything but heterogeneous and diverse in terms of religions, ethnicities, languages, and, and culture more broadly. Nevertheless, Kurds and other religious and ethnic groups were forced to either assimilate totally, cultural genocide essentially, or face physical annihilation. Early in this process, Kurds and other groups res resisted and rebelled, and, fo and then followed massacres, placements, and prisons. By the mid 20th century, the Kurdish population of Turkey had more or less been beaten into submission. Kurdish existence was denied. Uh, euphemisms like Mountain Turk were, uh, were used to refer to Kurds. 
Kurdish languages were were banned were banned and violently prohibited. Many Kurds stopped speaking their own language and adopted Turkish. Many Kurdish children grew uh, grow up monolingual, only able to speak Turkish to the to this day. Um, this this is one context within which the first phase of the Kurdish movement is the anti-colonial people's movements that reached a high pitch in 1968. Turkey and social during this period as lens and medical student groups demanded rights to freedoms. Many Kurds were active participants in these struggles, but they soon realized that their supposed comrades on the Turkish left wing often turned a blind eye to issues particular to Kurds. Amber, can you uh, do the slide? Hit that slide. Done. Okay. You got it. Okay. Um, this was and this so this was the uh, uh, political atmosphere in which the Kurdish Workers Party, the BK, a cadre of course, and working in late November 1978, they were led by Abdul Ojalan. Uh, who's in this picture, and adopted uh, at the time a Marxist-Leninist anti-colonial ideological line. As Ojalan explained it, their immediate task was to demonstrate the reality of Kurdish existence. They were, we might say, unapo unapologetically Kurdish. So they began to engage in cultural work amongst Kurds and build an organizational base. Most of this work was nonviolent. But they also engaged in attacks on hated landlords, uh, military, and police targets. In 1980, the Turkish military staged a coup. By this point, much of the PKK leadership had already been out of the country and had set up guerrilla training camps in Lebanon and Syria. Abdullah Ojalan spent the next several years in the Syrian Kurdish town of Kobani, where he and many other Kurdish militants were greatly admired by the by the uh, local people for their work amongst the uh, amongst the common folk. Um, in 1984, the PKK officially launched war against the Turkish state with the aim at that time of winning a separate Kurdish nation in Turkey, or back or as Kurds call it. The war was brutal and all, and all said something around 40 plus thousand people had been killed, mostly uh, Kurdish civilians uh, and millions more have been displaced. Kurdish political prisoners uh, have been and were brutalized in Turkish prisons. In 1993, the PKK called a unilateral ceasefire and sought a negotiated settlement of the conflict. It was at this point that the PKK and the wider Kurdish freedom movement began to reimagine what Kurdish freedom might look like. And this could be kind of understood as the second phase of the Kurdish freedom movement. In 1998, Abdullah Ojalan Oj was captured and sent to a Turkish military prison on Imar Imar Imarli Island in the Sea of Mamara, Western Turkey. He has been held in more or less solitary confinement for the last 23 years. Despite these conditions, Ojalan has managed to write books, ranging from pamphlets to large multi-volume works. In these writings, Ojalan communicated a new vision for the Kurdish freedom movement. Uh, over some, some time and intense internal debates, his arguments have been largely adopted within the movement. Could you hit the next slide? Amber. Uh, now I want to speak a little about the broad outlines of Ojalan's positions, and then I want to conclude by connecting it with a discourse with the discourse of decoloniality as articulated by the MP. Um, under Ojalan's influence, the PKK has abandoned Marxist Lenin Leninist uh, ideology alongside. Uh, the quest for a separate modernist nation state. Instead, they have adopted democratic confederalism and within Turkey call for democratic autonomy. The aim is not to separate, but as they say it, to democratize society. <clears throat> Could you hit uh, um, To quote uh, Ojalan, democratic confederalism is a non-state social paradigm. Uh, Okay, the non-state social paradigm. Uh, it's based on a grassroots participation. Its decision-making processes lie in the, uh, in the communities, end quote. For Ojalan, 
Democratic confederalism is the organizational form of a cultural transformation he calls democratic nation. And contrasting this vision to that of the modern nation state, Olgelon explains, quote, while the nation state pursues homogenized society, the democratic nation mainly consists of different collectivities. It sees diversity as richness. Life itself is only possible through diversity. The nation state forces citizens to be uniform. In this regard, too, it is contrary to life. Ojalan defines, end quote, Ojalan defines the, the oppression of women as, or identifies the oppression of women as one of the primary obstacles to any revolutionary transformation of society. Indeed, he views the oppression of women as one of the primary impediments to human development and freedom through history. He views the, the nation as the institutional embodiment of patriarchal violence. Quote, without gender equality, no demand for freedom and equality can be meaningful. In fact, freedom and equality cannot be realized without the achievement of gender equality. The most permanent and comprehensive component of democratization is woman's freedom, end quote. Now, can you hit the, uh, the next slide, Amber? Okay, but Oljuan you know, goes, goes much further in some of his analysis. Uh, as this quote, as this quote uh, says, the male has become a state and turned this into the dominant culture. Class and oppression developed together. Masculinity has generated ruling gender, ruling class, and ruling state. When man is analyzed in this context, it is clear that masculinity must be killed. Now, he doesn't literally mean we need to kill men. He, he's talking metaphorically about, um, you know, tackling patriarchal violence and the kind of what we often hear today is toxic masculinity, <clears throat> end quote. Okay. Uh, Ojalan ad identifies women as what he calls the oldest colony and insists on the necessity of their self-liberation. Now, uh, yeah, Amber, can you hit that next slide? Okay. Um, now I want to turn to decoloniality and this notion of kind of post post development, if you will. Um, there's a lot more that could be said, you know, here about Ojalan and so on, but I want to engage with the school of thought that has been developing within Latin America by the MCD group, um, a loose collective of Latin American intellectuals mostly. I don't think I have uh, time to really go into the history of this group, but I want to flag certain conceptual strands that I think speak to some of what I've uh, just gone over. Decoloniality refers to both an intellectual orientation and an ongoing active uh, practice, a praxis, if you will, of decoloniality. Uh, and really here, I can only gesture to a few relevant key insights and perhaps uh, during the Q&A. From the perspective of decoloniality, we can say that the Kurdish freedom movement is attempting a process of de-linking from the colonial matrix of power. That is a structure of relations of domination that have defined the modern world system. And in so doing, they, they are undertaking a process of what Walter Bignolo calls epi, epi, uh, epistemic disobedience and epistemic reconstruction. Also, involves research for colonial, uh, decolonial agency with the aim of Kurdish re-existence. Uh, which is an ongoing process of redefinition and re-signifying life and conditions of dignity, which would uh, include autonomy. Now, again, there's much more I could say, uh, but you know, I want to kind of keep it short for Q and A, so uh, we can follow this out uh, during that time. Uh, but I do want to have one kind of general conclusion. Amber will hit the that slide. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah, I actually had this slide as well about uh, uh, universal transmodernity. Um, but uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's the one. We can talk about that uh, in a second. Um, but go ahead to the next one, Amber. Okay. So in general conclusion, um, you know, we titled this talk, many, uh, many futures are possible and some are already in the making. And as I hope here, we've, we've managed to... Um, you know, suggest some, uh, something of the shape those, uh, these futures might be taking. Ethnographic participatory and engaged research is one of the great contributions of anthropology. 
Uh, clearly, of course, it has not always uh, lived uh, up to the promise and many times has fallen far behind in complicity with, with the co calling out the power. Never was the promise of mutual acknowledgement and understanding remain. Perhaps today we need to think of ethnography not merely as research, uh, but as a form of active and intentional solidarity. And I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, I look forward to your questions. Um, uh, thank you. Right. I'll try. Oh, go ahead. I'll try to turn the camera on and we'll see if it holds up. Yeah, we'll see if it works with, without without us sharing. All right, it sounds, it sounds good so far. I know we have a number of folks with us on Zoom and also here in the classroom. Sure. Does anybody have any questions for our speakers? I know, I know it's Friday. I know it's the end of term. I know everybody's tired. I understand. It, it, it was a lot. <laughs> well, a lot ahead, there. I guess. Um, hey, y'all, I loved your talk. It was so interesting. I Thanks. had no idea that any of this was even happening. Sure. Um, I'd like to hear some more about how the uh, gender theory is being put into practice with the activism that is going on with your work. In, 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 within the Kurdish community? Um, yeah. yeah, well, I mean, um, w there's a lot of examples uh, that we could, you know, we could talk about. I mean, in terms of in Rojava, uh, where the, the Kurdish movement has essentially established uh, this kind of autonomous region uh, under democratic and federal principles, um, there, uh, you know, there's essentially, uh, you know, this effort and, and very successful effort, actually, to include women in, at every level of the political process. Um, democratic confederalism um, is essentially a kind of bottom up uh, form of self organization, social self organization. So there are uh, at the kind of the base of society, you have various uh, what they call uh, communes. Um, now that's, you know, that can just be a neighborhood essentially of uh, say uh, a couple dozen families or, uh, you know, a village or something like that. But it's kind of a, just a small unit of people who are cooperating. And at that level, um, essentially the rules are that, you know, uh, women, women, you know, uh, you know, need to be uh, involved directly in decision-making that affect them. Um, so, uh, you know, every commune has kind of a um, council, kind of executive council, if you will. And um, uh, in those, there's always two uh, kind of co-chairs, uh, and those co-chairs are always one, one man and, and one woman. Um, and then as you move up the kind of organizational uh, structure, uh, that's replicated kind of throughout the, the organizational structure. So at the, you know, at the higher administrative level for uh, the region, um, you'll have co-presidents, um, and they're always uh, a man and, and a woman. Um, as well as in um, any sort of representative body, you need um, a, uh, a, 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 there's kind of a quota for women to participate, you know, for women's participation. Um, I think initially it was something like 40% 40, 40 uh, had to be, uh, uh, women had to be involved or it wasn't considered legitimate. Um, and they may have raised that recently. I, I'd have to look, but um, that's one way, you know, but I think on another level, outside of the, just the structural uh, level, you also have this kind of profound cultural transformation. I mean, I, I have Kurdish friends, male friends, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about how, you know, uh, you have to kill the man inside. Um, you know, you um, uh, essentially have to kind of undergo this, this kind of introspective process of, you know, analyzing and challenging your kind of own uh, patriarchal uh, mindset, essentially, and that's that's widely practiced within um, the Kurdish movement. Uh, in terms of the kind of military component in Syria, uh, women have their own uh, uh, military units. They're called the YP YPJ, um, the Women's Protections Units, and they're autonomous uh, and answerable essentially to the women who organize them. Um, 
and so on. So there's this kind of ongoing process of trying to, um, in, you know, bring women into the the political structure and um, uh, 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 have them lead it in, in many ways. In fact, the the person who planned kind of the final assault on ISIS's stronghold in uh, the city of Raqqa in Syria, um, what was a, a a woman commander. Um, you know, so, um, so yeah, that's, you know, there's, there's a lot going on, but that's kind of, I guess, maybe give you an idea. Is that, does that answer your question or? Yes. Thank you so much. Well, and women, women are too, um, can I just add one thing? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. women are like, have been key to the development of the philosophy of democratic confederalism yes. as well. Yeah. Um, like even though, um, Abdullah Ojalan is kind of, um, Oh, definitely a figurehead and considered by many to be like kind of a thought leader of the movement yeah. um you know he when he was you know working on his ideas he was working with um you know just in, insanely brilliant critical women um who were yeah. also part of the movement at, at the time and, and women were founders of the first phase as well they were co-founders of the first phase of the Kurdish freedom movement in the in the 1970s um and uh you know many of the f most famous uh, kind of uh, activists of the era, you know, are, 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 were women as well. Um, but yeah. Thank you so much. Sure, thanks. Louis? Oh, there's a question in the, is it in the chat? Oh, I may have missed it. Oh, there's a question from um, someone named Katerina Pasidomo. Oh, oh, how about that? <laughs> Who could that be? I don't know. <laughs> uh, old old friends. Hi, Katerina. Hey, Katerina. Do you want to do you want to ask it out loud or should we read it? I can. I don't want to be too much of an interloper since I'm not at the University of Alabama. I'm just glad to see you both. Um, and yeah, I am just struck by um, what I see as potential synergies between your work and just imagine that in a uh, conversation, at least informally, and possibly, you know, you're publishing together, I'm not sure, but I'd love to hear you talk about, you know, the extent to which your projects inform one another, or your conversations contribute to um, kind of new revelations uh, for, for each of your independent work. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely the case. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and there, you know, there are things that we, we have more overlap on. So, for example, with the um, with, with the Kurdish stuff sure. broadly, um, cause it's more than re, you know, you don't want to call it research, you know, it's much more than that. Um, so with the Kurd, you know, engagement with the Kurdish movement is a big area of overlap for us. Um, but then, yeah, of course, like, I mean, we both have our, our kind of individual trajectories, um, and our research mm -hmm. is very different in some ways, but yeah, it's in, it's in constant dialogue, I think, um, at least for me. Um, so yeah, like, like Pat's insights, you know, I, you know, sometimes end up bringing those into papers I'm writing or classes I'm getting ready to teach. And um, hopefully likewise, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, I think, I think we have very kind of like complementary um, approaches um, that developed, um, you know, it's just the, you know, di dialectic. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I basically just follow Amber around, you know, and whatever she does, <laughs> I, I take notes. Um, but, uh, but no, I think, you know, yeah, definitely a lot of overlap in terms of just the, the engagement with the Kurdish movement uh, here in the UK, um, you know, uh, uh, and yeah, you know, just kind of, I guess, sharing insights. We, we have a lot we just, of- We talk all the time. So yeah, we we mostly talk about there. work stuff. Yeah, yeah. We talk about theory a lot. So. Yeah, and I think, I think, you know, in some ways it's not the particular as more as kind of the general um, mm -hmm. uh, kind of background assumptions and things like that, that we, you know, kind of uh, work off of each other uh, with in some ways. So, yeah. Um, we haven't published anything together yet, except for some, some blogs. Popular, yeah. Some blogs and popular pieces uh, around the, the Kurdish issue um, a, a couple of years, a couple of years back, but um, but yeah, you know, there's probably probably a book there somewhere down the road. Who knows? <laughs> we need a sabbatical. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yeah, any. Uh, how are you doing? 
I don't want to turn this into a visit, <laughs> but how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. It's really That's nice good. to hear. Mm -hmm. Nice <laughs> to see your face. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, the three of us uh, from, you know, com coming out of the University of Georgia, you know, we're, we're here at the AU as friends. Don't, you know, we're, we, we come in peace. Yeah, UA. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And I'm right next door at the University of Mississippi. So right. we right. are friends. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't care about football, so we're friends. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question. I think there was another question from the classroom. Yeah. Hi, you guys. Thank you so much for, for giving this talk. It was wonderful. Yes. I, I was really I was really fascinated by this idea you brought up about, you know, Evans Pritchard being, you know, revolutionary in anthropological theory, but also being a colonial administrator at the same time. And, you know, many anthropologists who don't work in academia work with the government. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question is twofold. So firstly, do you think that anthropologists can do more good than harm in their work? And furthermore, how can anthropologists mitigate the harm they do as colonial administrators? Um, I, think, I think that any person on earth can um, try to do more good than harm in anything they're doing. Um, it, and it's important to, yeah, to, to be reflexive and things like that. Um, but, I, but I personally don't think, I think it's unethical to join up and be a colonial administrator. So. Um, so I would say don't do that if you want to do more more good than harm. Um, and I would say, you know, if if you're I mean, I know a lot of people um, are very, you know, engaged with this idea of like, I'll, you know, enact change from the inside of the institution. But I think we also have to remember that like institutions are institutions um, and they're made up. They're, they're more than just like one person um, and they they push back against efforts to um, enact radical change within them. Um, so, I mean, I, I work in development studies, you know, I have, you know, uh, which, you know, it's an interdisciplinary area, but there's definitely research in development studies that um, I don't agree with and find, you know, ethically questionable. Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's like, you know, don't, I think, I think don't approach things with either too much um uh let's say well be aware of what you're getting into if if you you know embark on work you know applied work for you know a big international organization or ngo or something like that do your research ahead of time make sure their values are in line with yours and if they deviate you know to a certain degree make sure that you can handle that personally um because like we're all really different people. Not everybody shares my politics, and um, my my opinion on these things. But yeah, personally, I think yeah, like in the extreme sense, don't you know, just don't be the colonial agent. Find another source of funding for your research. Um, personally, maybe Pat has thoughts. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would echo what you know what you're saying i mean i think you have to always um you know uh, analyze and uh you know question uh power relations the ones that you're a part of uh and the ones that you know you, you may be part of projecting on onto others um you know and i think uh yeah i mean i think that's you know you always have to do it yeah i would completely concur with amber don't be the colonial agent <laughs> um our administrator there, there uh, are also like varying degrees of being the colonial agent well that yeah no, I, I know um, so, but, so just to, to add to what i was saying um like like there are you know there are questions you can ask yourself and this is because we always you know as anthropologists as academics who do this sort of research um or as applied um researchers we're always walking like a fine line of contradictions and we always have to be aware of that. And, yeah. and so when you know, you're offered a source of funding or a project crosses your desk and you have to say yes or no, and you're evaluating it, you know, come up with criteria that are make it or break it for you. Like one, you know, is this project going to kill people um, if it's successful you know, down the road indirectly? You know, like, will it result in you know, maybe food insecurity or denial of health care or something like that? That's what I mean. You know, will it exacerbate existing conflicts potentially? Um, you know, do I have enough background knowledge to be able to know what I'm getting into? Um, do I have, you know, 
colleagues on the ground in that place so that I'm not just like walking in to, you know, a place that I don't know anything about and acting like I'm calling the shots. Um, so, I mean, you know, everybody can come up with their own questions. Sorry, I interrupted you, Pat. No, that's fine. No, I think, I think, again, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's really about, uh, you know, strongly kind of analyzing whatever power relations, uh, you know, you're, you're in, uh, you know, the Kurt, the Curtis movement, for example, uh, one of the keys to kind of, uh, they're moving to their second phase um, of democratic confederalism was, you know, again, I meant, I kind of emphasize Ojalan, but really this was movement kind of a bit wide discourse and, and what they call critique and self-critique. And basically as a movement, they, started these discussions amongst themselves and said, okay, um, you know, we, we have this goal. Um, is it working? Has it worked? Um, you know, are we, you know, executing that goal properly? What would be the best way to do that? Uh, what, what are we excluding? Uh, you know, what sort of power relations are active within our movement? And, you know, all those things were, were kind of discussed in, you know, for, for, for years um, in, some, in some ways. And I think, you know, that model, this kind of critique and self-critique model is something that, uh, you know, institutions like development, um, like, uh, you know, academia could certainly benefit from learning from, um, you know, in kind of the service of questioning, identifying, and if possible, dismantling some of the power structures that, um, you know, that, that exist. Um, but again, that's maybe a longer term project, but I think we always kind of have to have that, uh, kind of in our consciousness that I hope, I hope that made sense I hope, I hope that somewhat answered your question <laughs> yeah, we just take the keywords and ramble yeah <laughs> I'm kidding oh, my nose is running. Question? we have another question from Holly hi Holly oh hi everyone oh well hey where am I Hi. Hello. Thank you both for this talk. I love that you're working together and collaborating this talk as well. I just think that's so cool. Um, I'm a professor here in the Department of Anthropology and I'm the chair of the Decolonization Committee. So I'm super fascinated in what you all are talking about. And one of the things that, and I came in a few minutes late, so I apologize if this critical information was provided then and I missed it, but could you both speak to positionality? Right, your positionality as anthropologist and coming to do this work and how that sort of has shaped your perspective. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Amber, you want? Oh. I need to think about it. You want to start? Yeah, okay. I'll... Yeah, I mean, you know, coming into kind of uh, work in the uh, 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 Kurdish movement, uh, the Kurdish freedom movement in, in the UK, um, you know, definitely my position, you know, uh, initially was very much that of, you know, an outsider. Um, and, you know, um, Kur the Kurdish movement here um, is, you know, is very um, uh, 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 self-aware. It's very, uh, you know, politically conscious. And, you know, the, you know, uh, they, because as I mentioned, that notion of kind of critique and self-critique, um, you know, they're very good at kind of pointing out when you've overstepped your bounds or, uh, you know, uh, made, made assumptions that, you know, weren't due or whatever. Um, you know, so, you know, part of my position out, I guess, kind of getting involved with the movement and, and so on is, um, you know, coming at it from a place of, you know, real kind of humility i mean you have to you know uh i guess recognize that you're coming into a situation um uh, that was going on long before you got there and uh you know will be going on long after you're gone and uh so you really have to approach it i think you know with a sense of humility and in, in my sense you know in my case um you know uh you know Again, I, you know, I think the, the Curtis movement is very capable of kind of uh, uh, pointing out your your uh, uh, weak points <laughs> if, if necessary. So, um, yeah, you, you just kind of and you, and, you, and you appreciate that. You take that and you know you appreciate that and say, okay, you know, uh, let's let's continue. It's done out of love. 
What's that? Uh, I said it's, it's it's done out of uh like a radical kind of love. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To make, yeah. To make you better. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, in terms of my experience in Madagascar, that's a tough question because uh, like you're always, uh, or at least I am always thinking about my positionality when I'm doing research in Madagascar, um, a place where. Um, if any, if anybody's ever seen, and if you haven't seen this, look it up, but there's like a series of photos of Malinowski. Um, and I call it, I, I call these photos like the most uncomfortable anthropologist that's ever existed. Um, which is kind of funny because he was, you know, kind of in the beginning anyway, but he's, he's like sitting in a line of guys and he's clearly like in the Trobriand Island somewhere. Um, but he's wearing like this white suit and like socks up to his knees and it's just like perfectly rigid and you're like you know this guy does not fit in and I kind of like feel like looking at that picture you know like looking at that picture kind of makes me cringe a little bit but just like from that kind of sense of discomfort um but I think um uh, like doing research in Madagascar specifically the parts of Madagascar that I tend to do research which is in the south um very you know poorer regions less developed regions um like i will i'll never you know i have friends there i love it there i have you know kind of a second or third home there um but i will never like i, I will never be able to be of there um and i and i learned that very early on um and people are always reminding you of who you are as well. And this is something about working in Madagascar. If anybody there has, um, has done it, they'll probably be familiar with the practice of um, people walking up to you and stating the obvious just to keep you in your place. So in that sense, the people I work with, um, you know, have that kind of in common with, uh, with the, the Kurds that we, we know and work with. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's always a tough question, and rambly, imprecise answers I think are, you know, all I can do right now because I mean it's a heavy question too. But thank you for asking it. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we we are out of time, but I just wanted to say again that we really appreciate you, uh, Amber and Pat, for taking the time to come and talk to us. That was a really fascinating talk. And um, yeah, I hope, uh, you know, thank you also to the folks who joined us over Zoom, especially at this time of year. Um, so I'm gonna probably end this recording. I just wanted to say, have a great weekend, everybody. And also, you know, have a great rest of term for those of you who are still on term and also a great holiday break. Me too. Thank you. I see Ted Macklin. <laughs> oh, there, another one, another, another UGA, another Georgia. <laughs> I'm going to have to catch the recording. I missed the majority of